I don't think before I record myself doing anything, I'll pick up my phone and I start talking. And then that's it. 200,000 views, 600 likes. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of More Than a Sale with our guest. She's a great sleeping. following on social media. She's been in the business of real estate for almost 11 years. Daniel Levy. Daniel, welcome to More Than a Sale. Thank you so much. Your social media is super organic. Like, kind of walk me through your strategy. I think when you care less, it comes out more natural. Yeah. And people hire me because they feel like they can build a relationship with me and they can trust me. I post so much content. Yeah. I'm so big on the marketing. Is this something that you're doing conscientiously or is this just who you are as a person? I'm just very honest. I say it the way it is and that's actually how I get a lot of my clients. When you love what you're doing, it's like you're not working a day in your life. If you chase money, you're not going to make it. Money has to come after your hard work and dedication. Success also has a lot to do with being happy. And what makes Daniel happy? a really good question <laughs> if you were to advise a guy that you would say to that individual you have to have a strong personality and a lot of patience and if you don't that this job might be very tricky for you who is daniel levy and i don't think a lot of people get a chance to see who daniel levy is till they officially meet you yeah so who is daniel levy i am a very basic girl mm -hmm. that just loves to work. I love real estate. Real estate is like my number one priority, but you know, sidelines, you know, I work out a lot. I do a lot of yoga. I meditate. I eat healthy. I love hanging out with my friends. I'm pretty low key. You know what I've noticed about you? And uh, this is the first time that we're meeting, but since we've been following each other and connected on social media, your social media is super organic. Yeah. And it's so real to the bone and which I love. And I think a lot of people like that about you where anything that you're doing, even if it's your posts or uh, just your day to day, it's so unfiltered, it's raw, it's <laughs> organic. Is this something that you're doing conscientiously or is this just who you are as a person? I'm just very honest. Yeah. Very transparent. Mm -hmm. I say it the way it is. And that's actually how I get a lot of my clients. Have you always been like this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you where do you think it sort of originated from? Like who? My father. Your father? Yeah, my father's the exact same person as me, and I always told him, I'm "Like dad, like you need to get your real estate license." Yeah. I actually think that he would be better than me. I tell him <laughs> that all the time. What's your relationship like with your father? Can you tell me a little bit about that? When I was younger, we didn't really have that much of a relationship. It was hard for me to connect with him. Mm -hmm. I was obviously closer to my mom. I was more open with her because woman to woman, it's just easier to connect. Yeah. You know, it's harder when you're a woman and telling your father things. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I just became way closer to my father. And I'm like, comfortable to actually tell him things, even when it has to do with relationships, with my work. And I actually like his advice more because it's the opposite of what my mom usually says. So I have a really good relationship right now with my dad. What's one piece of advice that he's given you that has sort of stuck with you for a while? Work smart, not hard. Okay. Yeah. And you've been implementing that a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you, I'm obsessed with time management. Yeah. So if you're working smart, you're not killing yourself. You're not burning out. So I think that's really important. He taught me that since I was very young. We were talking about your family a little bit earlier and you said that I was raised in a childhood, uh, raised in a family full of love. Yeah. Um, and uh, you said that you had to work hard for everything that you have because you had you had your first job when you were 14, 15 years old. Yeah. So what was like growing up in your family? Um, was it, you know, and you were telling me that financially it wasn't the best, but from a, from a love standpoint and, you know, appreciation standpoint, it was there. So tell me a little bit about that. I always thought about it. I looked at other people and how, you know, their parents gifted them businesses and homes and all these things, but they didn't have actual love. Like they had divorced parents, they had trauma. I never really carried that from my yeah. parents. They gave me a lot of support and love, which is what I appreciated more. I was still able to get the things that I wanted because I worked for it and I didn't mind working for it. Yeah. When you love what you're doing, yeah. it's like you're not working a day in your life. And I'm yeah. sure you've seen that quote. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that has also helped me in my relationship with my friends and with my partners, just because I saw what real love was and what real support is. So I think that's really important. I think it's more important than just, you know, parent handing you money or a down payment. 
So I'm, I'm happy with the way things turned out in my life. I totally agree with you. In, yeah. in my household, it was a complete opposite. Um, you know, we, we're, we were immigrants in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we first obviously come into the country, you're hand to mouth. You know, every dollar, every penny sort of counts. And uh, so my father was always working. My mother was always working. Uh, I'd, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I wouldn't see my mom or my dad. And I'd, I'd panic and I was supposed to take care of my little brother. And then later on, I would call and my mom would be, you know, doing her labor job or factory shifts and my father would be out doing factory shifts or anything of that sort yeah. so growing up i i kind of saw that so i i was joke with my father i said you know every time you've been at my soccer game or any any leisure activity you've always been on your phone you've never properly sat down and watched a soccer game so he jokes with me he goes well we wouldn't have the facilities we had if i didn't work this hard so it's uh it's it's a very different uh, lifestyle but you know parents no matter what i find with what they have they give you as much as they can. Yeah. And and it's it's really on, you can make the most out of anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I find. Whether you have a lot or whether you don't have a lot, love at the end of the day is what matters the most and the bonding and affection that you have with your family. You and can't you mentioned, have it all. Yeah, you can't have it all, yeah. all, all together. Yeah. Um, and, and did they motivate you to get your real estate license? No. No. That was no one in my family's in the industry. Yeah. I don't even know anything about it. And so. have, you, have you helped your family sort of invest in real estate, buy real estate? And kind of get their feet wet into the uh, market? I, I try and teach them. Mm -hmm. I think there was a point in time where my dad took some money and just invested it in, in stocks instead of real estate, which yeah. I kind of wish he invested in real estate because <laughs> it would be so much money. Yeah. But I, I, I try and teach them as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say they're proud of you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> They brag about you all the time at all the family parties. They do. And, yeah. They hand out my business cards to everybody, even though everyone in my community is a real estate agent. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like my daughter's the best. You know, I find, you know, I find, and, and I was, I was talking to one of the agents in my office and they said, well, Ron, everybody in my family is real estate. There's an agent, the uncle, the aunt. Yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, if you think that, think like that, then you're going to think you're never going to get the business. Yeah. Ask yourself who's actually putting that effort forward to get the job done. Because when it comes time for them to buy something or sell something, they're going to look at the agent who's actually putting the time and effort in not just a handout like hey i'm your relative you yeah. have to give me the business you know what i do what do you do Tell i me. just i post so much content i'm yeah. so big on the marketing yeah and i talk about real estate at every like family gathering yeah knowledge is power i i show them what i know yeah and it sticks with them and they still call me so when you when you when you when you post your content, yeah. have you always been very active on social media, or is this you said you said you're very low key? But is this conscientious of you posting stuff, or the fact that you want to show people uh, that look, this is how things should be done in the first place? Like, kind of walk me through your strategy. How do you kind of? I'm go definitely about it? not low key on social media. Okay, like I'm low key in my real life, like yeah. behind closed doors, like sweatpants, sweater, make dinner, watch a movie mm -hmm. instead of going out. Mm -hmm. But on social media, I'm, I'm pretty loud. I don't think before I record myself doing anything, I'll mm -hmm. read like an article. I'll start to understand it. I'll look into it. Like I'll educate myself before I pick up my phone and I start talking. No makeup, just sitting in my living room. Yeah. And then that's it. 200,000 views, like 600 <laughs> likes. So okay, cool. I think when you care less, it comes out more natural. Yeah. And I don't want to make it seem like I set things up and like I'm doing my hair and my makeup. Like it, it doesn't, it's not natural. Yeah. And people hire me because they feel like they can build a relationship with me and they can trust me. Yeah. They get to know me. Like I have people that literally message me saying, how's, how's your family? Like, how's your friends? You haven't posted in two weeks. Are you okay? These people don't even know who I am, yeah. but they feel like they know me because of the content that I put out. Yeah. So I feel like that's really important. I want to focus on your journey in real estate because I think mm -hmm. it's so spectacular. Yeah. And um, and there was a time when it just things just blew up for you. So from the time you got your license to where you are now, yeah. talk to me a little bit about the journey. When did things officially started taking off? What are some of the challenges that you faced uh, during that process? Walk me through that. I really want to know. So when I started, when I got my license, mm -hmm. I didn't have any challenges in the beginning. It's yeah. only after when I started realizing how the market really is. And I, I was aware of that because I work for realtors. So I know that things are up and down and you're not always going to have good years. Right. One year you'll make a hundred grand. The next year you'll make 800 grand. Like it's, right. it's different. So you also have to save for like a really bad day, which, you know, I was smart about like at least this year. At least this year. At least okay. this year. Yeah. This was the, my only bad year. That, yeah. Well, that I consider bad. I don't know if other people would consider bad, but I have very high expectations for myself. Like, I want to see seven figures, six figures. Like, I never want to see anything less than that. Okay. But um, also because of my lifestyle and I like nice things and yeah. whatever. But 
Uh, the beginning, I didn't have any challenges. It was only this year when things were really slow. All my buyers disappeared because they're kind of just waiting for the second quarter of 2024 to yeah. see rates go down. I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. My journey was great. I had fun with it. Yeah. I had fun with the marketing aspect of it, making videos, podcasts. I spoke to Bloomberg in an interview. Wow. I had so many people reach out to me saying, I want to talk to you online. Like, you know, come to this podcast. Can I write an article about you? So it was fun. Like, I just looked at it as like a fun thing. I obviously had challenges with like clients and like certain deals. Nothing was a breeze for me. Was there a deal that really stuck out for you during your years where it was one of the most memorable deals for you? For example, mine was a deal that I had done. I was about 22 years old mm -hmm. and I helped a... Uh, um, a gentleman, he was about, he was in his 80s. And this is the first time he was selling his home. And when he bought his home was in the 1970s. Wow. So he had never, and, his, and, he, and he grew up in this home. His children had grown up in this home. And I was working with his daughter and his uh, wife had passed away. And now it was time for him to, you know, he couldn't maintain the house on his own. So we were, I was helping him buy another property, uh, move him into a condo and downsize him and then sell his existing property. So it was definitely an emotional period. And you can see the challenges that this gentleman was facing because you see that age had caught up. Yeah. And, you know, when it came to the paperwork and, you know, the daughter was there helping and assisting and all of that. So I would, I had a convertible at that time. Mm -hmm. So when, every time I would show him properties, I would put him in my convertible. It would be me and this old fellow and we'd just be cruising in my convertible and we go to see the property that, that, that we're showing then we get out to help him out of the car and then you know we kind of go up the elevator so for me that was a very memorable moment that will always stay with me for the rest of my life was there was there a critical moment uh, that you remember with whether it was a client or a sale or, or does it have to be like positive <laughs> doesn't have to be positive okay. you could be positive or negative so i had a group of investors, three investors that yeah. bought a property in Melton together. Uh -huh. They owned other properties as well too. I don't know if they were, um, if they ventured together in every single property, but mm. for this specific property, there was a tenant in there. Yeah. And we had issues getting her um, out, but they paid her out and it was fine, but she was still living there when we had to list it. What I do, I, I usually get into, you know, I build a relationship with the tenant. So like the showings are, we go smoothly, whatever. During the time, the market just started turning in a negative way. But we still got more than like 60 showings in the first week. But it was strange because we weren't getting any offers. And it was a brand new, beautiful house by Madame. Right. And um, I got a call from two agents saying, your sign's like beat into the ground. Like she completely like destroyed my sign. Yeah. I'm like, okay, like I have to really deal with this. She's giving me a hard time. She's giving my clients a hard time. And it was just so hectic. She was so difficult. Like I got yeah. a phone call from the cops saying like she had like some illegal substance in the garage, like all this stuff that they found that wasn't hers. It was this whole thing that blew up. We dealt with it. And then finally I get something on paper, but my clients want a higher number. I was supposed to sell it over asking, even yeah. though, you know, I negotiated that deal for like three days. It was so insane back and forth back and forth back and forth i even had to like cut commission did everything that i possibly can to get them the number they want finally sold it over asking everyone's happy so many realtors were calling me how did you do that how did you do that i'm like listen like if you're willing to cut most of your commission and barely get paid for the deal then you're like you'll get the numbers that your client <laughs> wants. but it was so crazy like even like a really big realtor um in brampton called me i don't want to say his name and he's like how did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm literally listing one across the street and yeah. I had all these sellers call me like seven of them, like, Hey, 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 like I saw that you sold it over asking, how did you get that number? So something came out so of you, it. So you, so you cut your commission, but you, you to, to help your client out to get the numbers that you wanted. To do. I cut it to 0.5. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. And it was like an, it was close to like $900,000. Wow. Yeah. But at least, you know, you know that at this point, I got to get them something and, and this is this is the best it's going to be. I just wanted the relationship with them. Yeah. I did not care about how much money I was making off of that deal because I knew that they own more property and I'm still very close to all of them. So I had, so. A, very, I had a very similar situation where I was showing properties to a buyer mm -hmm. and the challenge was the market was extremely hot. So yeah. we were putting in offers, but we kept losing out on the offers. Yeah. And of course based on the recommendation from the mortgage broker, we were not allowed to go over to a certain point. Yeah. 
So we finally like a property and uh, we put in the offer and there's multiple offers and she really likes the property. And then now she's adamant on not going higher on the price. And I spoke to the mortgage broker. He's like, please do not go higher than this. Otherwise we're going to have challenges. Yeah. And the seller was stuck on a particular price. So I did what anyone would do. And uh, well, hopefully anyone should do is I said, you know what? I can't keep showing more properties. I really, they really like it. I'm not going to let some figures get in the way. So I also cut my commission. Yeah. So I minused it off 1%. Yeah. So 2.5 was the commission at that time. So I made it 1.5%. And the listing agent called me. He goes, are you sure you want to do this? He's advising me not to do this. Yeah. I said, look, man, you're, you're not helping me out over here. Yeah. But there's multiple offers. You're telling me to come up in higher in price. You're telling me the seller wants this amount of money. Um, I'm like, I don't see any other way altogether. Long story short, we get the deal done. And then he gives me a lecture after. He goes, you shouldn't have cut your commission, this, that, blah, 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 blah. I look, buddy, you got a signed deal? He goes, yeah. I go, congratulations. Leave it with me. Don't worry about what I, you know, what I, what I do. Uh, and the client really respected me for that. So I, I, think, I think when you go that extra mile, that's what matters the most for buyers or sellers. Yeah. Where they know that generally nobody would do it. But that's when you show them that you, that you really care. I've done it a lot. Yeah. And, and agents give me lectures too. I'm like, listen, I'm not selling one house every day like these multi multi million dollar agents that are trying to lecture me yeah like you're at a point in your career where you built this clientele where you could just say no to people that you know want one percent back cash back yeah i will do whatever it takes to make my clients happy and treat them all the same rather it's a rent a rental client or a buyer it doesn't make a difference to me because all my rental clients turn into sales so I treat everyone the same with the same white glove service. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and that's the right way to do it. Yeah. You know, I had a situation where I was dealing with one of these buyers and we I sold their property and unfortunately they ran into financial problems. Mm -hmm. And their property was going on power of sale. They had gotten the notice and before officially receivership could take place, the loophole was you quickly sell the property as fast as you can to, you know, get the funds. So I sold their property. Obviously at that point in time they didn't get the price that they wanted and the fact that their children had grown up in the property. Yeah. And when you go to the house, you know it's a special house when you start seeing the height marks oh of God. their child on the on the mark. So, you know, wife's crying, husband has tears in his eyes, and then I was supposed to help them buy another place because we would get some of the funds, they would clear their debts, and we would take them all together. Yeah. Every time I would show a property, really nice properties, upgraded properties, they wouldn't like this. They wouldn't like that. They wouldn't like this. Now I'm past 30 properties. All right. Wow. And I was around 23 years old at the time, 22 or 23 years old at the time. I don't remember. I'm getting frustrated because I'm saying, look, we're missing out on these great properties. We, we, we created a plan. We would sell this and we should have never sold our house. And all the emotions come out from the buyer altogether and they just explode. And, you know, we had to, you know, work with them. Long story short, they never ended up buying. I held, ended up getting them a rental place and they kind of held off because the emotions were so high after that power of sale that they couldn't get back into it. And I was thinking to myself, I said, man, did I go, did I, did I do something wrong? Yeah. You know, and they never picked up my phone after that. They never spoke to me again. Really? Uh, they never worked with me. I said, was it something I said? Was it something I did? And in my, and you know, when you're working as a realtor, you're always putting your best foot forward with, with pure intention. And you question yourself sometimes. You know, you question yeah. yourself. And I got a little bit sad during that period of time. Has there been a, has there been a point in your career or in your life professionally or personally where something got you down and you were just like, I need a break. I need to get out of here. I need to just take it easy. I need to, I need to just kind of, you know, get away from it and just kind of recoup and regather my energy and just come back at it again. It's happened to me a few times and usually actually happened to me a few weeks ago, right? Everything has slowed down in real estate. I was just exhausted, mentally drained. And, um, I went away. I went away for like four weeks. I went to Miami for my birthday. I went to LA. Then I went to New York. I hung out with my friends. I was positive. I was happy. And now like I'm, I feel fresh. I feel good. Like even though things are not in the greatest place, I'm so motivated. How do you, how do you feel when you're going through that? Like, like explain to me your, your, your process. Like mentally, what are you feeling? Emotionally, what are you feeling? You know? I feel depressed. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel unmotivated, which is weird for me because I'm, I'm usually super motivated. But then I remember there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And especially in jobs like this, it's hard because you also have your personal life, right? And you have to separate your personal life with your job. But sometimes your personal life interferes with your business and you can't let that happen. And it, it's difficult because we deal with our stuff too. And people don't understand that in sales yeah. jobs, 
when you have your own business, you're an independent contractor, like that business is your baby. It's my baby. Like I'm going to work 10 times harder for myself than anyone else because I built this from scratch. I need to take care of it. So that's why sometimes when I'm in that like depressed mood where I don't feel motivated and I can't snap back into it because it's a mental state, right? Like it's a mindset. I go away for a bit. You know, I always have money set aside for emergencies. And to me, that's an emergency. Taking time to myself, thinking things through. It's really good to be in your own thoughts sometimes and really just figure things out. So when you're in that rut mentally, everyone has their different ways of working through it. Some people eat a lot of food. Sometimes <laughs> they drink a lot. They're, you know, they, they, they exercise their energy somewhere else. How do you work yourself through that rut? mentally and talk yourself back into the game is there someone that is your support a supportive individual that you can speak to family member friend uh, significant other whatever the case may be how do you walk me through that that process because we we never we never get a chance to hear about this as well everybody yeah. has their own metrics of walking themselves through their own rut for me yeah. I uh, any any time, and I was talking with my uh, with my gym uh, gym friend as well. Yeah. I said I said anything that happens in your life, your first thing is you go to the gym. That's your safe haven. That's your safe yeah. place. For me, the safe place is my library and books. I I escape to books and like escape to, to my library. That, yeah, and that's my way of regathering my thoughts, relearning, and just being in a quiet place with my thoughts. And I walk myself through the process and I walk myself out of whatever I'm feeling by acknowledging what I'm feeling, by accepting what I'm feeling, yeah. by making myself understand of the circumstances that I'm in, how I got there, how I have to get out, what led to it, um, and and where where I could be doing better. So there's a, there's a walkthrough that I have, but I do that in my quiet space, in my library, while reading books and listening to things to get myself out of that rut. What does that look like for you i usually don't air out my problems to anybody okay because honestly people just don't get it yeah. unless you're going through it uh -huh. with that person you just you don't understand and i've i have tried speaking to significant others previously and they're just like oh get over it you know what i mean like it's never been <laughs> constructive advice yeah so i meditate a lot i do a lot of yoga i do yoga probably like five to six times a week sometimes wow. for two hours um, hot yoga specifically, not mm -hmm. regular. I'll do Pilates. So that's my type of workout. I don't go to the gym gym. Um, I always make sure that I'm eating clean because when I eat bad, I feel even worse. And I Google success stories, like people that came from nothing and that became these like big bosses, especially females, you know, for me, that really pushes me. And that's what I'll do. And then it motivates me. And then I'll just think of ideas that would make me different than other realtors. Like I know I'm in, in an oversaturated business and I have to like show people why I'm better than the next agent that you just interviewed because usually they interview like four or five agents. And I've been successful at that. Like I don't think that I've ever, I think one time I got a call saying, yeah, I think I'm going to work with someone else. And that's because it was like a referral to them. But aside from that, like people choose me right away. Because I'm honest. I'll tell people straight to their face, you're not getting this for your house. And they come back to me after they hire someone else that promises them something that was a lie. So, yeah. Speaking about motivation, mm -hmm. and you said when you learn about, you know, especially success stories of women, who inspires you? So it doesn't have to be real estate, right? I actually, I don't know if you watched the limited series on Netflix called Made. No, I haven't seen it. I so, will check it out. Yeah, she was a single mom, like living in a homeless shelter, abusive relationship. She used to get beat up by, you know, her daughter's father. And she pushed herself through by cleaning houses. She became a maid for like very successful people. And then she wrote a book and that book made her famous. And then they made a Netflix series out of it. And now wow. she's like a millionaire. Wow. And I also read up a lot on e-commerce success stories 18 year old kids that you know, trying to find ways to help their parents then building like a seven figure business in like two months stuff like that wow yeah that's incredible mm -hmm. and when you read these success stories what are some of the biggest takeaways that you've used from these stories to implement in your own life consistency you know just because you fail at something let's say for three weeks something's not working out for you for two months you're not closing deals like you are 
going to close deals if you keep pushing through. If you're going to knock on a hundred doors, one of them's going to call you back. Like if you're going to do it every single day for like four or five hours a day, someone's going to call you. Someone's going to be like, Hey, can you come give me an evaluation on my house? Yeah. Let's list it. You know, you just have to keep pushing through. You can't stop. You know, the success formula is, is, is so it's not really different. Yeah. You know, there's so many different ways of describing success, but all it boils down to are similar traits that you see over and over again. Yeah. Hard work, consistency, dedication, motivation. When I look at success, I look at it in the fact of what moves are you making? What do you have in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. What do you have that's got going on with you? Well, all of us, we can sit over here and we say, ah, I want to make a bazillion, gazillion dollars and uh, have this, you know, th th this much amount of money and this many amount of cars and this yeah. jewelry and these clothes and we want to live in this house and drive this car. That's fantastic. But what opportunities are there in front of you or what line of work are you in that can allow you to live that life? You're not magically, it's not going to fall from the sky and land in your plate unless you win the lottery. You gotta, but even then, there's, a, there's an old joke, okay? There's an old joke. Uh, there's a gentleman, he goes and he goes to God and he prays every single day, God, you know, I hope I win the lottery. God, yeah. I hope I win the lottery. He goes the next day, God, I hope I win the lottery. He's praying every single day. He's praying every single day. He's praying every single day, years and years and years. And one day God gets fed up and God comes down and he slaps him. He says, how can I make you win if you don't buy a lotto ticket? Yeah. I've heard something like this before. So, so, and I, and I, and I this, this it's, it's, it's a joke or, or, or a story in the sense where if you don't put in the work or you're not in the space, how can I help or how can you get there where you need to be? Yeah. So it's, it's, and so what does success look like for you? How would you define success? I don't think that you have, you can just like look at money and be like, I'm doing this for money. Yeah. You, if you look at it that way, you're not going to make money. Yeah. You can't chase money. Yeah. Someone, I used to hang around like a lot of successful people because that was also one of the things that motivated me. And like when you hang around people like that, you're going to be successful. You know what I mean? So they always told me, they're like, if you chase money, you're not going to make it. Money has to come after your hard work and dedication. Yeah. So to me, success does not equal money. Success also has a lot to do with being happy and positive because when you're happy and you're positive, all these good things start happening in your life. But if you're miserable and every day you wake up and you're like, oh, I have to do content today. I have to cold call today. You're not going to get anything yeah. out of that. Yeah. It's not going to happen for you. And what makes Daniel happy? It's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I've what? asked so many questions now that you had a breeze of answers, but you're like, hmm, what, what makes, makes me, me happy? happy? Yeah. Honestly, food. Okay. If I could eat whatever I want and I had a fast metabolism, <laughs> I'd be so happy. But I eat salads every day. I'm like a rabbit. Yeah. You know, like food makes me happy. Traveling makes me happy. I'm the um, same way. You know You know when they say if you get three wishes, what would be your wishes? My, my wish would be I could eat anything and never get fat. You know, that would be... That you would know be, what my wish would be? What? If I can have anything in the world, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to worry about money. I'd move to an island. I'd have a farm with all my animals. Just quiet. And just rescue cows and horses from like slaughter. That's what I would do. Wow, incredible. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on a podcast, guys. I'm telling you, I love animals so much. I was a vegan for like a year and a half. Uh -huh. And then I became a pescatarian. And then I started eating meat again because it's hard um, when you grow up eating meat, especially with Middle Eastern parents. And... That's what I would do. Yeah. But I, so if you had a, if you had a, if, so let me follow up with that. So if you yeah. had a alternative career option, you not corporate lawyers now out of the, uh, out of the picture. Well, it's not really, but, yeah. but I don't think you want to do that anymore. So if you were to have an alternative career and let's say you wanted to give up real estate, what would that career be now for you? A yoga instructor. Yoga instructor. That travels the world. Cool. And that gets to see animals. That was new for me, by the way. Like, I fell in love with yoga about, like, nine months ago. Yeah. And I love it. I love the people in my classes. I did yoga in L.A. I did yoga in Miami. I met so many different people. I did yoga outside. I started hearing about all these retreats. But if money wasn't, like, an issue in this crazy, messed up economy, I would probably be a yoga teacher right now. But listen, that might change in, like, a year. <laughs> I'm never giving up real estate. I love real estate. It's always going to be my full-time job. I'm just saying, like, I may change my mind and be like, oh, maybe I should have been a lawyer. I don't yeah. know. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. 
No, no. What it seems sounds like is that you seem like a you know very uh, passionate individual, and uh, and and you have a knack for learning, and you want to explore the world. Not only that, but you want to learn as much as you can, and yeah. take from the world as much as you can. Yeah. And uh, what would you what would you say is is uh, you know are things that you could improve on, or you need to work on personally and professionally on yourself? Oh, good question. Um, I'm not a therapist. I promise. <laughs> it feels like it <laughs> probably my anger yeah yeah I, my my clients have never seen it but behind closed doors probably my anger yeah i feel like that would make me a happier person if i just worked on that a little bit i have that little moroccan fire in me for my mom got it so probably that yeah and knowing what you know now mm -hmm. if you had to tell the younger danielle at you know 19 years old or 18 years old, what advice would you give that Danielle? You should have gotten your license at 18. Okay. <laughs> okay. You've been a multimillionaire now. <laughs> what else would you advise? Um, Has there been, so let me rephrase that for you. Yeah. Has, if, if you could go back, knowing what you know now, was there an opportunity that you felt that you missed that you could have taken advantage of? Real estate related? Anything related. I, well, I talked about this in one of my videos. I yeah. wish I bought a crap ton of pre-con in wow. 2016. Wow. Uh, that's when I was 18. Yeah. Yeah. Things were better. You were in a better place back then. You know, I find, I find, and I, and I, and I thought about this myself as well, because I, I bought a few pre-cons around that time, mm -hmm. 300,000, mm -hmm. 400,000, and they've literally doubled or tripled That's why. in their, in their price point. Yeah. But when you, but the buying power at that time too, when you were buying, it still didn't feel cheap because you're like, I'm buying a condo or it I'm buying. It never feels uh, like that. It never feels like that. No. So I learned this lesson myself personally that it's always expensive no matter what, whenever you're buying. Oh, yeah. yeah. And 10 years later down the road, you thank yourself for buying it. I remember I bought a condo uh, uh, four years ago. And at that time, I, I, I bought a condo for, I think it was four hundred fifty or $500,000, a one bedroom. Yeah. And, uh, and four years just flew by. And I'm up, I think, $175,000 in equity. See, people don't realize that in the moment. So when I explain this to clients that come to me for pre-construction, I tell them that I converted my lease client last year to buy pre-con. Yeah. Because I basically broke it down for him exactly the way you just said it. Yeah. And he's like, shit, like I have the money in the bank with inflation. I mean, yeah. might as well put it into something. And real estate is you know, a great investment. It's not like it's like you're investing into a stock where it's like one day it could be down, one day it could be up. Like at least with our market, we know we like, we've studied enough to understand like the trends, even though it is a little bit bipolar. <laughs> but. So let me, before we, before we conclude the podcast, the yeah. last question I want to finish off with is this. If you were to advise play by play to a agent that recently got his license or her license in the industry, what would be a play by play, um, guide that you would say to that individual of how to have a successful career as a realtor? I think that if you have no knowledge in the industry getting in, you should definitely work with a team. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go in thinking that they're going to have it all and then they automatically fail and they drop within the next, you know, 365 days. Yeah. And if you already have knowledge in the industry the way I did, I suggest working on your marketing plan because then the day you're selling yourself and you have to pick things that will make you stand out. You have to be creative. That's the best advice I can give to anyone starting off. And just know that you have to have a strong personality and a lot of patience. And if you don't, that this job might be very tricky for you. So that's just my advice to any new realtor. And I get many agents reach out to me saying, hey, I'm getting my license. Like, I just want some advice. And I give the same advice every single time because that's advice I took for myself. And I got rookie of the year. So obviously it worked. Has an advice from any particular agent that you looked up to or was really successful that stuck with you that really made an impact for you in your business? There was an agent in my office that told me, she makes over a million dollars a year. Wow. Yeah, she's amazing. She told me, she's like, you are gonna go through times where it's dark. She's like, I make this much money and I still go through these times. I go through these times every few days when I'm not doing a deal because it really gets to you. When you're a closer, it gets to you. You just have to remain positive. You have to really work on your mental health. 
incredible mindset. You know, it, this is uh, it, it was really nice having you on this podcast, and I learned a lot about you today, and yeah. uh, in terms of how you operate, and you're a very positive individual, and uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's been incredible. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of More Than a Sale. We had the lovely Danielle Levy here with us. Uh, check out our Instagram, follow her if you don't already, uh, and stay tuned for the next episode. 